I've also had that hesitation about getting it done. Tonight, vaccine worries. A look at why some Yukoners are hesitant about getting the COVID-19 vaccine. This government will not allow coal developments to jeopardize the mountains, headwaters, foothills. The Alberta government was going to stop protecting some areas from coal mining, but now they say those protections will continue after all. And we meet a group of youth in Winnipeg who are helping elders to help themselves. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Recently, we brought you an inside look at the Yukon's vaccine rollout, which is on track to vaccinate most of the adult population by the end of March. But as APTN Sarah Connors tells us, not everyone in the territory is eager to roll up their sleeve. Thanks to mobile vaccine clinics like this one and Carcross, the Yukon is aiming to have 75% of its adult population vaccinated by the end of March. But that still leaves 25% of the population unvaccinated. I've also had that hesitation about getting it done. Carcross Tagish First Nation Chief Linda Dixon admits she was reluctant to get vaccinated at first because of Moderna's speedy approval. But in order to move forward with getting our lives back to a semi-normal, um, we have to do something. And, you know, I mean, I'm okay. I took the vaccine yesterday. I have a little bit of a sore arm, a little bit of a headache. But other than that, I'm fine. At the Whitehorse Correctional Centre, where most inmates are Indigenous, only one-third of the inmate population chose to be vaccinated. Viewer comments on APD and social media also shows distrust of the vaccine. As these people write, fake cure for a fake pandemic promoted by fake authority, and it's not a vaccine, it's an injection. Mathia Alatini is the COVID-19 response coordinator for the Council of Yukon First Nations. She says social media is rampant with misinformation. There's all this weird questions around, am I going to get monkey DNA or something? Well, no, it never would have passed <laughs> inspection at Health Canada. She says just proving conspiracy theories and providing credible reading sources are key to clearing misconceptions surrounding the vaccine. A lot of those individuals, if you can have calm conversations and be able to offer the resources that they can independently look at or they have somebody that they can talk to, that usually alleviates some fears. There historically has been a hesitancy um, for, for something like this. Dr. Anna Banerjee is faculty lead of Indigenous and Refugee Health at the University of Toronto. She says some of the vaccine hesitancy can be traced back to experiments that happened in residential schools. And so these kinds of experiments, um, you know, make a lot of people with good reason uh, be, be wary of, of government interventions. Are you going to get the vaccine? I am absolutely going to get the vaccine. <laughs> Dr. Evan Adams of Indigenous <laughs> Physicians Association of Canada says there's other reasons too. I think others who are mistrustful of big pharmacy, mistrustful of government, mistrustful of, kind of public workers, that why are they suddenly interested in my well-being when in the past they weren't. Dr. Banerjee says calming fears about the vaccine starts at the top and it's important for Indigenous leaders to lead by example. If they're the first ones to get vaccinated and, and they can see that, you know, they're fine, there's no side effects, then that encourages more people to get vaccinated. Banerjee says if Indigenous communities want to get back to normal, vaccines are critical, but they must be rolled out with care and understanding. It's building trust, and I think that's what we really need uh, to build, rebuild trust. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. To Ottawa now, where today the Prime Minister announced a delay on taxes related to SERB benefits. He also said travelers coming back to Canada by land need to show they've been tested for COVID in the previous 72 hours or face fines or quarantine. This measure will go into effect February 15th. And for people getting SERB benefits, they can delay paying taxes on them without penalty until April of next year. 
We tax income uh, related to uh, employment insurance, for example. The CERB is there as a repla income replacement measure. Some people will not have to pay taxes on it if their income is low enough. Uh, many others uh, will need to pay their share of taxes. That's just how our system works. But we are giving uh, an amnesty on people uh, on the interest payments on repaying uh, their, uh, their ta CERB taxes because uh, we know that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, still, we're still going on in this pandemic and it's a tough time for everyone. Good news for many there. Well, Canada's top doctor is commenting on the significant drop in the number of new cases of COVID-19 over the past few weeks. Dr. Theresa Tam says the lower number of new infections and falling rates of hospitalizations and deaths are reassuring. But the rapid spread of the new variants is concerning. Over the past week, the total number of new virus variants detections has more than doubled. Seven provinces are now reporting variant detections, and the first detection of the P1 variant that was first found in Brazil has been reported by Ontario. Although it is normal for variants to emerge as viruses continuously evolve, these are considered variants of concern because they're known to spread more easily. There is also a possibility of reduced protection of current vaccines. Dr. Tam says it's crucial for Canadians to continue to adhere to public health measures to prevent the variants from reaccelerating the epidemic, making it much more difficult to control. We'd like to hear if you're concerned about the new COVID variants. Here's how you can continue that conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on our website, aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Time now to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, why a proposed new suburb is so controversial. Yes. Vice Chair Gower? Yes. Chair El Shantiri? Yes. Welcome back. The Inuit blockade of the Baffinland iron ore mine in Mary River, Nunavut, is now in its sixth day. And the mine owners are now warning they can't keep this up indefinitely. This was the scene yesterday at the Mary River airstrip. This small group of Inuit have set up camp on the runway and are blocking a road. They're opposing a proposed expansion of the mine which would double capacity and add a train to ship the ore to port. Mary River is located 160 kilometers south of Pond Inlet, Nunavut, and they usually fly in their workers and supplies. In a press release, Baffinland stated today, continued suspension of air travel and blocking of medicine and supplies will have an impact in the near term. Two First Nations in southern Alberta have joined together to challenge the province. After its decision this past summer to rescind a policy that protects certain regions from open pit coal mining. Now Alberta has announced that the policy is back. And while it might be a step in the right direction, some critics say there is still a need for Indigenous consultation. What we're doing today keeping the 1976 coal policy in, in place and committing to consult on a modernized policy is what we should have done in the beginning. Alberta's we energy minister, again, Sonia Savage, says she admits the province made a mistake when it rescinded the 1976 coal policy this past June. This government will not allow coal developments to jeopardize the mountains, headwaters, foothills, the policy has been reinstated after the Blood Tribe and Siksika Nation launched a legal challenge against the province for cancelling the policy in the first place. The 1976 coal policy was created to protect these areas in blue, 
They're lands along the eastern slopes of the Rockies that border First Nations communities. They are completely silencing any First Nation opposition. Founder of Nitsitipi Water Protectors, Latasha Kafrobe, says reinstating the policy is a step in the right direction, but the announcement failed to address Indigenous concerns. The Alberta government is definitely responding to a certain demographic of people standing up. They are responding to Albertans, they are responding to hikers and hunters and all of those that are worried about campsites. All of that is true and very important things to protect, um, but the Alberta government is not responding to First Nations opposition. They are not making commitments to meaningful consultation. They are not making commitments to uphold treaty rights. APTN was unable to reach leadership from both communities, but Kafrobe, a member of the Blood Tribe, is calling for more than a policy to be put in place. A policy is only a promise, and until there's further protection put in place over these areas of land, further protection put in place over First Nations treaty rights, um, treaty and Aboriginal rights, and further protection put in place to protect the headwaters, um, these areas will remain unsafe and at continuous risk. There are other areas that are potential sites for proposed projects. Kafrobe says she's preparing a petition asking for the federal government to conduct a regional environmental assessment for those projects. What this has, has made apparent is that our waters, our lands, our livelihood, they are still not safe. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Now to a development of another kind that is also causing concern. The Algonquins of Ontario have proposed that a new suburb be built in Ottawa. They're calling it Tewin, meaning home. The city is close to granting the group the gigantic development project, but as Jamie Pashagumscum explains, many Algonquin chiefs are against it. Councillor Hubley? Yes. Vice Chair Gower? Yes. Chair El Shantiri? Yes. That was the City of Ottawa's planning committee saying yes to the new project late last month. The plan is to build a new Ottawa suburb here on this land purchased by the Algonquins of Ontario. The new neighborhood would be located in the southeast end of the city right next to a major highway. What the city likes is that it would be located right across from the Amazon warehouse creating employment for future residents. But a major factor in council's approval was for reconciliation. Whereas city council is committed to uh, reconciliation, uh, with the, uh, reconciliation with the local Indigenous communities and recognize the important work of the Algonquins of Ontario as a meaningful opportunity towards achieving this goal. But who are the Algonquins of Ontario? Algonquins of Ontario are uh, a formed group of uh, not recognized status Indigenous people. They claim to be Indigenous. They, their ancestor traces back 300, 400 years ago. They, uh, there's only one recognized community that is Algonquin uh, federally, which is Algonquins of Pequawkanagan. Chief Dylan White Duck is from Kitigan Zibia Anishinaabe. It's an Algonquin community, but in Quebec. Because most of the Algonquins of Ontario aren't federally recognized, Chief White Duck is upset that the city of Ottawa is considering this land deal and that the federal government and province are currently negotiating title elsewhere with the Algonquins of Ontario. This is an ongoing issue that we've been battling for, for several years now, the Algonquins of Ontario. And the extinguishment of, uh, of title is, is, is being worked on by the federal government, the province of Ontario. The Algonquins of Ontario declined an interview, but gave this statement. We are disappointed by the decision of our relatives in Quebec to publicly air their opinions about our transformational development project Tewin. The rhetoric that advances Indian status or federal recognition as the only true markers of indigeneity is tired, archaic, and perpetuates colonialism. Non-status Algonquins are real Algonquins. That's why we had them intervene in the courts. You know, it's in abeyance now. We understand that we're in uh, we're in negotiations. We're in a reconciliation process. We're moving towards working with Canada on Le Breton Flats, but we don't want to go down that route again. APTN reached out to Ottawa City Council, but didn't hear back, and to Mayor Jim Watson, but we declined an interview. Council will make its final decision on Wednesday. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa.
to the East Coast now. Four Mi'kmaq fishers in the Atlantic region are raising funds to sue the federal government. The class action is on behalf of all Mi'kmaq individuals to enforce their right to fish to earn a moderate livelihood. It's a right that Supreme Court of Canada has upheld, but the Mi'kmaq fishers are still being charged for fishing without a license. Now some of them are uniting to file a class action suit. It wants the Crown to not lay charges and enforce the right to earn a moderate livelihood. It's to apply to all Mi'kmaq individuals and the traditional Mi'kmaq territory, which is the eastern seaboard of Canada. One of the fishers is Cody Kaplan. He's facing over 10 charges, including fishing without a license. We, we got to come together uh, as a unit, you know. Uh, we, can't, we can't just keep making deals with DFO. I mean, what's good for one is good for, you know, it should be good for all of us, all in Igmagi. Time to step aside for one last break. Still to come, a group of young people in Winnipeg work their way through the midwinter deep freeze. I think when they join us, it gives them a sense of purpose. It makes them feel like they belong to, you know, something, you know, bigger than themselves. Welcome back. Time now to take a peek at our photo of the day. Today's photo is of what is believed to be a 100 foot long cedar tree. It washed up on the shore of Quadra Island near Vancouver Island. Janice believes it may have been swept away by a landslide from early December 2020. Well, if you have a great photo and would like the chance to see it as our photo of the day, you can send your photos to share at aptn.ca. Now time to take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, minus 4 with snow in St. John's, 3 below in Halifax. Minus 12 for Kujuwak, minus 3 in Nain with snow. Minus 7 for Montreal, flurries and 14 below in Shibugamu. Minus 12 with snow in Sault Ste. Marie, 10 below with snow in North Bay. Minus 21 in Thunder Bay, 23 below for Sioux Lookout. Minus 24 with snow in Churchill, 26 below in Norway House. Minus 22 for Winnipeg, Gimli and Princess Harbor. Minus 25 in Regina, Estevan, Yorkton and Saskatoon. Minus 28 in Uranium City, 27 below for Meadow Lake. Over in northern Alberta, minus 27 with snow for high level, 28 below and sunny in Fort McMurray. Sunny and 30 below for Red Deer, 26 below for Edmonton. Zero in Vancouver, plus two in Victoria. Minus 22 under sunny skies for Prince George, 23 below and snow in Fort Nelson. Minus 38 for Old Crow, 28 below in Whitehorse. Minus 20 for Yellowknife, 25 below for Wrigley and Norman Wells. Minus 20 for Saks Harbor, 34 below in Fort McPherson. Minus 11 for Chesterfield with snow, and 19 below for Cambridge Bay. Minus 16 in Resolute, minus 14 in Arctic Bay. Dramatic video to show you now. It was shot on Sunday as powerful floodwaters began sweeping away buildings in northern India. Just moments before, part of a Himalayan glacier broke off, sending a devastating flood down river. Hundreds of homes were damaged or destroyed, as well as a small hydroelectric project. At least 31 people were killed, and another 165 are still missing. Closer to home, a group of youth in Winnipeg's North End are doing what they can to make the community a cleaner and safer space. Their new foot patrol group called Initiative is giving back to the community in a variety of ways. Daryl Stranger has more.
Shoveling walkways of elders is just one of many ways these members of the youth group initiative are cleaning up Winnipeg's North End. The group is shoveling elder sidewalks as one way to give back to the community. One of the group's creators, Riley Nepanak, says he started the group in June of 2020 as a way of showing youth community pride. I think when they join us, it gives them a sense of purpose. It makes them feel like they belong to, you know, something, you know, bigger than themselves. Um, it gives them a chance to, you know, develop empathy and understanding for others. On top of shoveling, the group also hands out backpacks on Sundays with essential items for anyone they come across that might need it. The backpacks are filled with sleeping bags, thermal pants, and personal hygiene items. One volunteer says his own son played a role in why he wanted to join initiative. Uh, I have a small son of my own actually and uh, he was a big factor in why I do this. I like to think about uh, why some of these elders and some of these single mothers have a hard time getting in and out. Like I have a hard time getting in and out of my house. So I thought, why not come out here and shovel and try to help out as much as I can. River Nipponak Fontaine also says joining the group builds confidence. I find that when the youth get involved, it shows them that when they grow up that they can help more people and not only just stay on the streets and do other things that they can. And it helps them get engaged in their community. When it's not snowing, the group picks up garbage and sharps on the streets of Winnipeg, while also hauling around wagons filled with juice and snacks. Riley says he hopes to expand the model into northern communities. I want to help communities up north implement the same type of program. Give the youth up north the tools to help their community, to clean it up, to help the people without houses, and, you know, give them the tools to become the great leaders that we all know they are. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. What a great idea. Looking forward to hearing more from them. A new episode of Face to Face is just moments away. Our guest tonight is artist and activist Serene Fox. She just released her directorial debut, In and Day, about her auntie and oldest matriarch, Mary Bell. Fox filmed the documentary during the pandemic. With the pandemic, there was this immediate sense of urgency. Um, that our elders were um, once again at risk. And so for me as an Indigenous person, um, our elders have been at risk for quite a while. And, and we see that just in um, how much they hold when they go, the stories, the songs, the, the teachings. And I think there was this universality that happened during um, COVID where um, collectively as a nation, we all started to think about our elders. And I think that was a really important moment. And you can watch that entire episode in just a few minutes' time. And that is all the time we have for your APTN National News this Tuesday. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern as host Melissa Ridgen puts the child welfare system in focus. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.